the earth. So, Father God, we just praise you for Norman, and Father, we pray that as he shares with us from the Word, you would help us to to give our best attention to this, because you have spoken to him in his preparation, Lord, and we want to hear what you've been saying to him, and we want to hear for us, Lord, in Jesus' name. A oh, amen. Uh, amen. It's okay to say amen there. <laughs> what a wonderful Irishman. I had trouble putting this on this morning because somebody had done knitting with this, so Karen and I uh, have been trying to uh, sort it out. Would you like to open your Bibles to the book of Luke? <clears throat> if you're a visitor here today, we've been working our way through Luke, um, various people preaching from the book of Luke, and I would like you to be in Luke 13 today, and um, it's an interesting passage. This uh, little bit of scripture is uh, Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. Um, in a few days' time, or perhaps it's a few weeks, I'm not quite sure, but he will be put on a cross as a criminal. His only crime was that he loved people, loved his father, and wanted to demonstrate freedom to them. He wanted them to know his father and to find freedom in the name of Jesus Christ. But people were jealous of him. People were jealous of the way he spoke, of the way he demonstrated the power of God to people as an ordinary way of living, knowing God personally. And yet in the midst of that, it says as we look into Luke 13, uh, and I'm going to be uh, looking from verse 22, if you'd like to find that, I'm going to read from verse 22 round to verse 30. He's on his way to Jerusalem, but he's teaching people all the way. He's speaking of the love of the Father all the way. And here we go from verse 22. I'm a bit croaky today, so excuse me for drinking. <clears throat> it says this. Then Jesus went through the towns and villages, teaching as he made his way to Jerusalem. And someone asked him, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? And Jesus said to them, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, sir, open the door to us. But he will answer, I don't know you or where you come from. And then you will say, but we ate and drank with you. You taught in our streets. But he will reply, I don't know you or where you come from. Away from me, you evildoers. There will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham, Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God but you yourselves thrown out. People will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their place at the feast in the kingdom of God. Indeed, there are those who are last who will be first and the first who will be last. So, a little bit of scripture that David's given me to preach on here and it obviously coming at the end of chapter 13 because it is the end of chapter 13. And so, you cannot understand this bit of scripture unless you understand what's already gone before. And so, uh, I know it's all been preached to you by David. So I'm just going to do a little resume of what's been preached before. Because, you see, this guy walks up to Jesus and says, let me ask you a question. Are there, aren't many going to get saved? And Jesus <clears throat> doesn't ignore that question, but actually he narrows it down. He says, listen, we'll answer about that later. But what about you? <coughs> People often, <coughs> excuse me, they want to ask questions about others. What about this person? What about that person? But Jesus is always asking the question, what about you? Where do you stand with this Jesus of Nazareth? Where do you stand with this one who gave himself on your behalf? That's the question that I have to answer. That's the question you have to answer. Who is this Jesus and what do I think about him? And am I 
interested in what he's done for me and why he's done it. <clears throat> now, actually, Jesus does answer that question about how many would be saved because at the end of that chapter, it says, um, it says, actually, people will come from the east and the west and the north and the south and will take their places in the feast of the kingdom. And actually, he's talking about the many millions that have already, in our time, been swept into the kingdom and found freedom in Christ. And there he's looking forward to many who will come. But he doesn't want to get involved in some philosophical debate. He wants to ask these people, what about you? Where do you stand? Let me take you back a little bit, because that seems rather a stark question. Oh, suddenly I found myself, oh, now I'm in the light, light, the, the light shining on me, what about me? But actually, the parts of this chapter that have gone before help us to understand the importance of that question. Because in that question, if you remember, I read he said, make every effort to enter the narrow door. And the word narrow, sometimes you think, oh, people think, on oh, narrow thinking. But actually, the narrow door is not narrow because it's narrow thinking. It's a narrow door because it has to be sought to be found. It has to be discovered. What is this Christianity all about? What is interesting about this that I should bother to even find out? Let, let me just take you back through little bits that have come in this chapter of 13. First of all, before we can answer that question, what about us? So before we can answer that question that I need to search for this Jesus, I've got to understand who it is I'm seeking. And in that chapter 13, first of all, in verse 6 to 9, if you look in your Bibles, um, it says, uh, um, it, Jesus tells a, a parable, which is probably very well known to you. I'm going to read it. It says, a man had a fig tree growing in a vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but didn't find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, for three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. What use is it to fill up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one, uh, for one more year, and I'll dig around it and fertilize it. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, cut it down. That little parable before this question about what about you, what about me, is important because it's showing us that God isn't like some telephone salesman who says, well, you've got to decide now because the, the deal's going. No, what happens is here in this, in this little story, he's saying, actually, God is a God of compassion. That even though in this parable he comes to look at this tree and he's looking for fruit and, fruit and people are saying, oh, it's a waste of space, cut it down. He says, hold on. No, no, we won't do that. What we'll do is we'll dig it around. We will give it some provision. We will see if we can feed this tree and uh, we will care for it for this time and then we will look for fruit. So this start question, you know, uh, uh, what is it, make every effort to enter the door, which is a, a, a good thing to say, actually it comes from one who's full of compassion, who actually gives us time, who wants to resource us from the word of God and speak to us so that actually we can come to that point of bearing fruit. And then there's another little story that comes in chapter 13, and it's, a, it's about a lady. And I preached on this one some four or five weeks ago. She's in the crowd. She's been sick for many years, 18 years. She's been bent double. And, um, and then it says this in chapter 13, uh, verse 8. It says, she was bent over. Oh, sorry, it's not verse 8. I can't, I can't see. It's verse 12. It says, she was bent over and couldn't straighten at all. When Jesus saw her, he called her forward and he said to her, Woman, you are set free from your infirmity. That tells me something else of the provision. Not only is the provision of, um, of compassion of God when he's calling people to follow him, but there's also a provision of his personal intervention in our lives. And I'm interested in this lady because it says, when he saw her, listen, you may feel your miles away from God. 
You may feel, does God know me? Yes, the Bible says he sees us. He knows us. He's interested in us. We're not just a number. The Bible actually says something really remarkable. It says, even before we were formed in our mother's womb, he knew us. How amazing is that? And it says, Jesus saw this woman, and then he called the woman out from where she was, as it were, almost hiding in the crowd, bent over. He called her forward, not to embarrass her, but because he wants to speak something over her which will bring complete and utter freedom. He calls her forward, it says, and he says to her, woman, you are free from your infirmity. See, we've already had testimonies this morning of people saying, of, of speaking about God breaking chains and Barry standing up and, you know, goodness, you know, after 60 years of marriage, can you imagine Barry just losing his wife one day? She was a, a member of our, uh, our small group and, uh, and just wonderful to get to know her. And then the day came when quite suddenly she died. Now, she was a woman who loved God. She was a woman who had hope in God. And so, as Barry said, I know where she is. She has been received now into the very presence of God because that's what the Bible promises. And yet, Barry himself, it's, it's awful loss. And so what he was describing had was become like a chain. But actually, it's Jesus that breaks chains. So he called this woman forward and he speaks over her freedom. That's another thing of the provision of God. He comes with personal in, uh, intervention into our lives. He doesn't expect us to do it. You know the difference between Christianity and religion? Religion is what men and women do for God. Christianity speaks of what God has done for men and women. He's given his son to die on the cross, to break the power of sin in our lives. He's done it, and he calls us to follow him. But he's done it. His, Christianity is not a, a, a belief of lots of rules. I have to do this and I have to do that to try and be good enough. God knows we're not good enough. But he comes to make us good. He comes to set us free. He gave himself to pay the price for our sin, our rebellion against God, our selfishness, our desire to do things our way. He came. He stepped into our world to make it possible. So we've got provision of God. We've got the provision of compassion, of time. God putting something into our life, maybe speaking to us. God intervening in our lives like this. Maybe, you know, I often talk to people and they say, yeah, when I was young I felt God speak to me. Or I've had these dreams recently and God seemed to be speaking to me. Or I'm facing this situation and yeah, I, I don't know whether it's God, but I, I, I do understand what you're talking about when you talk about God speaking to me. Listen, God is so active. He chases behind us. He wants to find us. He wants us to know him. He doesn't say, go away and get yourself right, get perfect, and then come and see me, and I'll have a look at you and see if you're valuable and whether I want you. No, no, he doesn't do that at all. Actually, he comes to us knowing what we are like, and he says, I come to set you free. He is a God who intervenes. He is a God who provides. He is a God who comes to set us free. And there's a third story. And it, David preached on this last week. And it, it comes in verse 21. But I'm going to uh, read from verse 20. Jesus asked them, still in this conversation with people, what shall I compare the kingdom of God to? And then he says it's like two things. He says it's like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked, it worked all its way through the, the dough. And he'd also said, previous to that in verse 19, it's like a mustard seed which a man took and planted in his garden and it grew and became a tree. What's that about? It's revealing something about this God who is calling us to be with him. He's speaking of a God who has made it possible for us to respond to him. Did you notice? 
in that part where it talks about the mustard seed, it says, which a man planted. See, he had this mustard seed, and here it is, mustard seeds are tiny, and you can, have, you can go to B&Q, buy yourself your mustard seed, and you could be ever so pleased, look, I've got my mustard seed, put it in the jar, oh, but if you don't plant it, all you've got is a packet of mustard seed. Or if you've got some yeast, you know, sitting there bubbling away, I don't quite know what yeast is, but I know it's sort of living stuff, and it bubbling away, unless you mix it with the flour, the dough doesn't rise. You've got to do, so his provision is this, he makes it possible for us to exercise faith. I just want to go through these three things again. This God that is saying, come make every effort to find the kingdom, he says, yes, all right, but listen, you've got time. You've got time to, because I'm going to start speaking to you, I'm going to start leading you on the path that, that I want you to take. Secondly, he's a God who personally intervenes in our lives. Don't be surprised if you have dreams. Don't be surprised if you have thoughts that just come to you when you're walking the dog or whatever you're doing. This is God. He's chasing behind you, wanting your attention. He loves you. Don't be surprised if he then gives you an opportunity to take a step of faith. Now, if you're in the church regularly, you know that... Um, my story of when I was 14, when uh, I was a very shy 14-year-old, but somebody said, it's possible now for you to step from your sinful life into a life with God. And as a, a timid 14-year-old, I stood up because I knew what he was offering in Jesus was exactly what I wanted. I had tried, I was, you know my background, I was caned regularly at school. I wasn't naughty, I was just always caught. And I tried to be good. I really tried to be. So when this guy said, this Jesus is knocking on the door of your life and wants to come in, I thought, this has got to be what I need. I need him to do something because I've tried to make myself good and it doesn't work. So he's this provision of an act of faith. And I took that step of faith. And the sky didn't open. And, and all, but actually what happened was, a man said, do you know how to pray? And I said, no, not really. He said, can I pray over you that God would start to speak into your life? And I said, yes, please. And he, he prayed over me that God would start to speak into my life and that he, I would be set free from my sin. And he asked me to just ask God to forgive me. That's all that happened. And then I went off the next day and played paddocks or whatever we were playing. I just loved Crusader Camp. It was just fun. And so we come to this, so that background, compassion, personal in, uh, intervention, and the possibility of an act of faith comes into this thing where Jesus says, what about you? He says, it, um, sorry, I can't find it because I've got to turn the page. It says here, make every effort to enter through the narrow door because many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able to. You've been following the U Ukraine war. Can you imagine that you're a Russian person living in Russia? All the news has been cut off from you from outside, and or you're fed the what the Russians want the Russian people to hear. You don't know anything else. And they they had to say this tragedy going on where members of family are in Ukraine and they're ringing people in Russia and saying who are saying, no, we would never bomb people. We would never kill civilians. They say, but bombs are falling on my house. And they say, no, no, we can't believe that. That's not what we've heard. Richard Dawkins has done a good job at trying to destroy any hope in God in people. I don't know why he spends so much time trying to persuade people that there is no God that, uh, and he doesn't believe in the God. I mean, if he doesn't believe in it, why spend all these time? There must be something going on in Richard Dawkins that makes him so angry against God that he doesn't want anybody else to believe in the God he doesn't believe in. And one of the things he says is, you can't be intelligent and follow Jesus. I want to just tell you about three people who pressed in and did exactly what this scripture says, who made every effort 
to enter through the narrow door. Not because they were narrow in their thinking. In fact, they were revealed to be narrow in their thinking before they stepped through the door, but once they stepped through the door, they realised that actually they had been narrow in their thinking by saying, we don't believe in any of that. The first person you may have heard of. He's a man who had the privilege of uh, uh, leading the team that wrote down and revealed the human uh, genome, which has been used by doctors, uh, you know, to, to really understand medicine in a, in a way that's wonderful. His name is Dr. Francis Collins. You may have heard his name. I'm not talking about those who, who discovered uh, DNA in the first place, but Francis Collins was asked, can you now lead a team that will be able to write down the human genome? so that this can be used by doctors. Actually, he was a Christian, but he hadn't always been a Christian. When he was a young doctor, he had the responsibility for, to, for looking after terminally ill patients. And as happens, I, I guess, between a doctor and his, uh, per, in that sort of situation, a lot of open conversations were ha had. And uh, they became very intimate, and he would talk with his patients. He was caring for them. He knew they were at the end of life, and he, he, he loved them, and they would share their heart with him, and he would share his heart with them. And one day, one of an elderly lady who was now right on the last few days of her life, she spoke about a hope of heaven. And he heard this before from many of his patients, but didn't really understand it. And then she said to him, Dr. Collins, do you believe in God? And he was flustered. He said, uh, 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 well, I haven't really thought about it. And she said, oh, I'm surprised, you being a doctor. And he walked away from there and realized that as a doctor, he would never take things that everybody else said without investigating it to see if it was true. And so uh, I think he went to see his local Methodist minister who reached around on his bookcase and pulled out um, uh, C.S. Lewis's book, Mere Christianity, and said, try reading that. And he said he opened it and found that C.S. Lewis was, had struggled with exactly the questions he was thinking about. How, how can God do this and all that sort of stuff? And in reading that, he realized he hadn't really thought about it at all, but he then started to read his Bible and discovered a personal relationship with Jesus. God took him on to lead a team that wrote down the human genome, which is now such a help to everybody. That's one person. You may have heard of him. Another guy recently um, who is worth uh, learning about is a guy called Lee Strobel. Lee Strobel was an investigative um, uh, reporter. So he would, he would, you know, I don't know, find something naughty happening in the corner here that everybody was trying to hide, and he'd, he'd dig around and he'd bring it all out into the open. Anyway, uh, Lee Strobel, to his horror, uh, he was an atheist, to his absolute horror, his wife went to church and became a Christian and started to secretly read a Bible, and he, he knew what she was up to, and he was quite angry about it. And uh, in fact, he was so angry, he thought, well, I'll prove it's not true. I'm an investigative, you know, reporter. And so he started visiting people and interviewing people and going to Christian meetings and saying, you know, because he was sure they're all completely bonkers. And the trouble was, the more he read his Bible, because he knew that he had to read the Bible to find out what they believed, the more he read his Bible, it was almost like God was saying, hello, I'm ever so pleased you're opening this book because I'm here. I, by the way, I'm the one you don't believe in. And so he, it took him ages, but more and more he became aware that this Christian message was true. I don't know what his wife was doing. I'm sure she was giggling, but uh, she, she, was, she was not trying to get too involved because she wanted God to deal with her husband because otherwise she knew he was going to just blow a gasket. And he ended up writing a book and the book is called The Case for Christ. And then he wrote another one called The Case for Faith. And actually, what he discovered was he had been very narrow-minded, but actually the way to discover who God is is to enter through the narrow door. 
Not because it's a narrow-minded door, but because it has to be looked at carefully to discover what's the way in. So there's two people that dis- deny totally what Richard Dawkins would like us to believe. That you, you know, you've got to be thick as two short planks to be a Christian. That's not true. What about Anthony Flew? Ever heard of him? Ant- well, you obviously don't read philosophy. Anthony Flew was one of the foremost philosophers, atheistic philosophers of our time. He only died of a, a while ago. And he had a fire. for 40 years, he, he had a huge following of people who, because he was very anti God. But he had one philosophical sort of mantra which he followed faithfully, which was this follow the evidence wherever it leads you. And towards the end of his life, he kept following the evidence of the scriptures and what the Bible said about God. And just before he died, he came to that point where he realised that God was real. And he wrote a book to the horror of his millions of followers. And it was the, the title of the book was, There is a God After All. <laughs> and they wrote some really foul things on the internet about him because of what he said. But actually he'd followed the evidence wherever it leads and discovered that philosophically, even without faith, there was a reason to believe in God. See, this is the narrow door that Jesus is talking about. Now, you don't have to be a philosopher to do it. You don't have to be an investigative reporter to get to it. You don't have to be the great doctor to get to it. I'm just illustrating that actually this now, these people took their time to say, if there is a God, I want to find out who he is. Because Jesus goes on to say this. He says, um, he says many will try to enter and not be able to. There are many Pressures to say, don't believe that, or you we haven't got time for that. There's a, a parable Jesus told about the one who sows the seed, the, the sower, and some falls on the, the path and gets trampled on. Some, the weeds grow up, you know, the cares of life grow up. It's only the seed that falls on good ground that actually produces a crop. And Jesus says, take your time. Take your time to enter through the narrow door. And then it goes on, and I must look at this too. It says, it says if you look at the scripture, it says, I tell you, many will try to enter, but not will be able to. But once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, please open to us. You see, this is the truth, that our lives do not go on forever. I know the common idea is that, you know, oh, I'm invincible, I'll go on forever. And people get very disappointed when somebody dies. Listen, I don't know anybody that, well, that's a silly thing to say. I was going to say I don't know anybody that hasn't died. I mean, that that is complete daft. What I mean is everybody dies, is what I'm trying to get at. It's the 100% certainty, in fact, it's the only probably 100% certainty apart from taxes, that, 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 you, you know, And yet people live as though it's not going to happen. And when it does happen, they get angry with God. Why did he allow this? You say, hold on, it's built into the very mechanism of who we are. That we are born, and we live, and we die. But the Bible is saying, but that hasn't had to be the end. The Bible says, because Jesus has stepped into our world, and died on a cross, and been raised from the dead, and said, actually... You also can be raised from the dead. He said things like, in my father's house are many rooms. If it weren't the case, would I tell you that I go to prepare a place for you? And that has gripped me ever since that day when God gave me the opportunity to take a step of faith that I have discovered it to be true. That the older I get and the closer I get to heaven, the more excited I'm getting. So if you think I'm bad now, wait to see what I'm late later. Aren't you excited about what God has for you? Or have you so put your roots down in this world that you can't bear to leave it? That's not 
it's good to be faithful. It's good to enjoy this world. It's good to raise families. It's good to all those things. But God has something better for you. And it's not pie in the sky when you die. It's hope while you live now. That actually you've something to live for. You've got something to aim for. You know why you're here. And you can have confidence that although there are many, many things that you do not understand, there is one in heaven who understands. There is one in heaven who spoke about Jesus coming even before he came. Do you notice something about this? If you look at this scripture, it says, once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door. Have you ever noticed what that scripture says? What did it say the owner was going to do? Get up and close the door. The Bible tells us elsewhere that at the moment, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross and was raised from the dead, is seated at the right hand of the Father. And what's the Bible, some of you know, what is he doing seated? Sorry? Interceding for us. Asking the Father that mercy would be shown to us. That he would speak to us. That we would find faith to follow him. He's interceding. But this Bible says, Jesus says, but a time will come where he gets up. And he gets up to close the door. Now, I don't know what that means, the day when a person dies, or, or, or could, it, could it mean just the end of the world? I don't know what it means exactly, but I do know this. At this moment, he is seated interceding for us. He's interceding for your children. He's interceding for your friends. He's praying that the life of the Father, of the Holy Spirit, would come to you, and you would know why you're alive. But a day will come when he will get up. And the Bible is saying there will be a day when he closes the door. I always think it's amazing, don't you, that somehow urgency comes to us when it's too late. Or the nearer we get to something happening, it suddenly becomes urgent. Why are we like that? Why don't we plan ahead? We think we're intelligent. Don't you know that a day is coming when your life will end? Or have you got a special ticket? Buy into the last round. No, you haven't. Our lives are going to come to an end. Why don't we prepare for it? I watch these programs where elderly retired people are going to buy themselves, I don't know, a, a mansion in Spain. I think they've only got about six months to go. <laughs> Shouldn't they be thinking of preparing for that, what's going to happen? But we don't. We put it off, put it off, put it off, put it off. Many will try to enter but won't get in. But put it off, put it off. That's stupid. That's small-minded. That's narrow-minded, isn't it? Well, why is it we always miss things when they're gone forever? And then we get all sentimental. Oh, oh that old car I had, it was so lovely. No, you used to moan that it would never start when you were going to work. Oh, but it was so lovely. Why do we miss things when they're gone? Listen, the day is coming, the Bible says, when... God will close the door on your friends. Actually, on you as well. Are you ready? Are you ready for him? Are you, are you, are you instructing your children that truth? Are you living knowing that your life is going to come to an end? Or are you living as though it's going to go on forever? How, how do you manage your finances? How do you manage the, the things you put your time into? That's why we've stood here today and worship God. Not... Be, be, because we, we, we've got this hope for the future and we've got this hope for now. The truth is this, on the day of judgment, which is what the Bible calls it, the day when we will stand before him, a distinction will be made. Now, today nobody likes distinction. Everybody wants, oh, everybody's included. Oh, it's every, everybody's included. You know, the government even, dis dis uh, governments, not, I'm not starting about to be political, the governments, they, they, they talk about a broad church. That means, what does it mean? Well, it means everybody, ed any of you can come in and nobody knows what's right. But actually, the Bible isn't a broad church. Speak about it. It talks about those who have come to Jesus Christ and asked him to be the Lord of their lives and said, Lord, 
I know I need you in my life because without you, I can do nothing that will last for eternity. So on the day of judgment, a distinction will be made. And the distinction, do you see this distinction in this chapter? It says, it says in verse 28, there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. Those words are sort of seem very old-fashioned to us. People grinding their teeth. What, what is it speaking about? It's speaking of total regret, of a feeling of utter foolishness. Why didn't I pay attention? Why? It, actually, it says there's a distinction and they are outside for the door is closed and they will not be allowed in. This isn't God trying to be horrible. Actually, what he's trying to say is, I'm warning you now, so that, that will not happen to you. I can't bear that you'll be outside the door, regretting and, and gnashing your teeth. I don't want that. I want you to know me now. Not just then, not as a, you know, sort of a, an assurance again. I want you to know me now, so that you grow to know me now, and you live now knowing my goodness. Because... I'm going to walk with you into the future. And you know, when we stand, if we're a Christian, when we stand before Jesus' throne, when we stand before him, the only thing that will allow us to get in is not how clever we've been, even what we've done on the earth, all those things. It will be this. Am I one who owns Jesus as my Lord? Am I one for whom I'm saying, Jesus died for me. He took away my sin. That's why we sang about the blood. It's a very odd thing to sing about you know, Sunday morning. Sing about the blood. What funny thing. It's talking about the blood of Jesus Christ. When he hung on the cross, it says, he shed his blood for us. He was the sacrifice. In the Old Testament, they'd taken the blood of, um, of lambs and, and animals and sprinkled it. Here, Jesus is giving himself on the cross. For us. That's why we talk about his blood, because his blood is referred to in the Bible as the covenant blood of God. In other words, when we put ourselves under the, the freedom of Jesus' forgiveness, the blood of Jesus, we are declared free forever. It's a covenant. A covenant is not just like a promise you make, it's a promise that will never be broken. And it says there'll be a distinction and there'll be those outside. And those outside say things like, yeah, but didn't we, didn't we do this? Didn't we do that? Jesus said, those are very good things, but you never surrendered yourself to me. You never stepped over the threshold. You never said, will you be my Lord, please? And so, this is the chapter 13. Jesus said to them, will you make every effort to enter through the narrow door? Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and not be able to. Once the owner of the house gets up and closes the door, you will stand outside knocking and pleading, Sir, open to us. But he will answer, I don't know you. If we are going to be with Jesus in heaven, the only right of entry that we have is this. It's a right of entry that has been gained for us by Jesus when he died on the cross. When he died on the cross, he said over humanity what he said to this woman, I now set you free. And do you remember I said that God gives us that privilege of exercising faith, of saying, I do want this. And I'm just going to give a, a little opportunity. There, sometimes when I, I preach, when anybody preaches really, in scriptures like this, God speaks to you because this is a living word. I, I've, I, I, what I preached to you this morning is, is a, a tiny little corner of what I felt this passage has meant to me as I've looked at it in the last three weeks. I found it very challenging. Things that I'd noticed, like Jesus, you know, seated and then getting up and closing the door. I thought, Lord, thank you for praying for me. Thank you for interceding for me. That, that, that not only when I was 14 would I give my life to you, which I did, but Lord, all the times when I was 19 or 18 and, and I was going to go and do my own thing, you still followed behind me. 
And when I did go and do my own thing, you arranged situations that allowed me to once again exercise faith to come back to you. So you may have asked Jesus into your life when you were a young person, and now you oh, I don't quite know why I am. Listen, there's always the possibility of stepping back into faith and saying, I want to follow you, Jesus. He doesn't say, well, at about time too. He says, I've been waiting for you, and I'm delighted that you are there. So I'm going to give an opportunity. I am standing in response to this scripture. If God has spoken to you as we've looked at this scripture, in a moment, I'm going to ask you if you would just stand where you are. And, uh, but I'm also going to say, if you have never given your life to Jesus Christ, there's an opportunity for you to do that third thing of exercising faith. And I'm just going to ask you to stand with all the others. And then I'm going to lead you in a prayer. But it's a prayer that you pray, where you just say, Lord, I just want to receive this life that you have for me. I want to receive forgiveness. Forgive me for my sin. Even for my going away since I was a young person and now I'm coming back, Lord. Will you come and renew your promises in my life? So, I'm standing up. If you would like to join me in standing, would you now please stand? And I'm going to ask you if you've just put your hands out to God, just like a child to their parents. And uh, I don't know exactly why you're standing. There are different things that God... But I, I just want you now to just speak to God, please. Would you just say, if you need to repent, if you need to say, I've never repented of my sin... Uh, repent means turn around and start running in, uh, going in a different direction. It means a change of mind. You, just tell him you're going to do that now. Just speak to him. You don't have to necessarily say it out loud. Just talk to him. He's listening to you. Would you ask him now to come again into you? Uh, or if it's the first time, ask him to be your Lord. That means you put confidence in the future he has for you. Would you, would you also thank him that he has given himself for you? He died on the cross. Would you please make a point of saying, Lord, thank you that you gave yourself for me. I don't deserve it, but thank you. Now, would you ask him to fill you with your ho his Holy Spirit? Because you can't do this on your own. You don't, you're not expected to now carry on on your own. You started by asking him to be the Lord of your life and you've asked him to forgive you for your sin. Now ask him to fill you with his power. The power of the Holy Spirit. The one who comes alongside you to help you. Just ask him, fill me with your Holy Spirit now. And now would you ask him that his kingdom would come in your life. And he would continue speaking to you and opening your heart and your mind to his love for you. Thank you, Lord. Father, we stand before you now with our hands lifted out. Just say, Lord, we come as children before our Father. And we ask you now to fill us. And we ask you to take us forward. And Holy Spirit, we give you permission to keep talking to us. And I pray that we would never feel we cannot talk to you about anything. We, we can talk to you about any, everything, Lord. I pray that we would just find increasingly a renewed personal relationship with you, the living God. And we ask that now in Jesus' name. Amen.